Hey there, thanks for tuning in to New Life Church. We hope that this message helps you grow in your walk with God. Before the message begins, please like, share, and subscribe to NLC Lancaster on Facebook and YouTube to stay up to date on all of our sermons. If you'd like to invest in the ministry, please visit newlifelancaster.org forward slash give. Thank you again for tuning in and know that God loves you and so do we. If you guys want uh, to turn in your Bibles, today we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 25. So if you have a device and you want to turn, turn on your device, or if you want to open a Bible, whatever you need to do to open up to Matthew 25. Uh, so as I said, as you're turning there, today is Speed the Light Sunday, and what that means is uh, we're, we're raising money for Speed the Light. You know, I don't know if you guys under, know that, so Children's Ministry, they raise money for BGMC. Uh, BGMC, they raise money for resources for missionaries so that they might share the gospel. Uh, Speed the Light is an organization that raises money for vehicles for missionaries so that they can share the gospel. And so right now, Speed the Light is partnering with uh, Project Rescue. And Project Rescue, the goal... Project Rescue needs three vehicles in order uh, to, to share the gospel by going in and rescuing people who have been um, captured and are now enslaved in this human trafficking that's going on in India. And so what we're doing today afterwards, as we've, we shared, is that we're, trying to, we're raising money in, in our uh, youth ministry for Speed the Light to partner with the Project Rescue by just having a spaghetti dinner, trying to, trying to do something where we can all eat, all have fun, but we can also just do something to raise money, raise, a, um, raise some sort of financial support because Speed the Light relies on youth ministries. Uh, it partners with youth ministries all throughout uh, for our district. It's Pennsylvania, Delaware district. We're, we're partnering with Speed the Light All these youth ministries are coming together and we're trying to raise money. So we're going for $90,000 to try to get three vehicles in there uh, out to India uh, so that they might be used to help rescue people who are currently enslaved in human trafficking. So um, if you guys, uh, this is maybe your first time here, this is your first time hearing about it, we bought plenty of food so that if you guys did not sign up, feel free to please come down afterwards immediately after, uh, after service. All right. Can you hear me in this one? All right. Oh, I forgot this is down my shirt, so that's not going to work. Um, all right, so Matthew chapter 25. Today's message is going to be is called uh, Sheep and Goats. Today's message is called Sheep and Goats. So if you want to turn verse 31, Matthew 25, verse 31. says this, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or need, uh, needing clothes and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly, whatever you did not do, for, the, uh, for one of the least of these you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment. 
but the righteous to eternal life. This passage uh, is, uh, I remember the first time I heard it, it, it really packed a punch. It was really, it, it was all a gut check. It really like made me reflect on, okay, what is my, uh, what, have, what have I been doing lately? And um, I think that it even more so had power, it had it challenged the people who are listening to this immediately. Jesus is talking to a bunch of Jewish people, Jewish first century Jews in this passage, and I think that this passage was greatly challenging to them, and I'll, and I'll explain more. Um, have you guys, well, no, you know what, first, imagine, I want you guys to do something. Imagine that um, you're overhearing a conversation, whether you're at the movies, or maybe you're uh, at a bookstore, or a coffee shop, or something, and you're overhearing a conversation, but all you hear is this one statement. All you hear is this. You hear, you hear someone say, yeah, he was the chosen one. Immediately, what comes to mind? When you hear someone being called the chosen one, who, who do you think they're talking about? Who's the chosen one that you're thinking of? Okay, you guys think of Jesus, but you're also not in a Christian setting. At the movie theater, you're like, oh, okay, I'm thinking of Jesus. Okay, that, that shows, for me, maybe I'm, not, <laughs> maybe I'm not as spiritual as you guys, but I would have thought of maybe The Matrix. If you guys have ever seen The Matrix, I, I mean, it's, you know, uh, this, you know, I watched it before I was really following Jesus, so if you guys want to throw stones at me. Uh, anyway, The Matrix, Neo was called The Chosen One in The Matrix, um, uh, and uh, another movie, uh, if, some of you guys might be thinking of uh, Star Wars, if you guys know Star Wars, I thought immediately if I hear The Chosen One, I start thinking of the scene when Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi are in this intense battle, and Obi-Wan Kenobi's like crying out to Anakin, and he's like, you're, you were The Chosen One, it said that you were supposed to destroy the Sith, not join them, and he's crying because... Anakin ends up joining the Sith, and he becomes the Darth Vader, and he was supposed to be the chosen one. Uh, or one of my personal favorites is actually something that probably none of you thought of, is I think of Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> Kung Fu Panda is one of my favorite animated movies, and Kung Fu Panda Po is a panda who is a chosen one. He's the dragon warrior who is going to defeat, like, this evil tiger. And Anyway, but that's, that's usually that's one of the ones I think of when I hear the word chosen one. Um, but some of you guys might not be into pop culture, not, might not watch movies. If I said, if you heard someone say, um, instead of maybe the chosen one, if you said, oh, that guy's the goat. For some of you guys who might not know what goat means, goat is like a modern slang acronym for greatest of all time, usually referred to athletes. So if we're saying, oh, that guy's the goat, who do you, who do you immediately start thinking of? Who's the goat? Tom, <laughs> get out of here. No, you're not. Um, so we had a lot of people just say Tom Brady. Um, okay, you know, I respect. Respect, respects you. He's, he's pretty good. Um, <laughs> Tom Brady, some people might think Michael Jordan. I read an article this week that Michael Jordan is the goat of all goats. I don't know what authority they have to say that, but Michael Jordan, some people are like, no, LeBron James. Some people who are love hockey are like Wayne Gretzky. You know, he's the goat. He's the greatest of all time. Um, Pastor Ron's the goat. That's right. That's right. Greatest pastor of all time. We got him here. Welcome to New Life Church, everyone. We got him. Um, see, titles like The Chosen One or The Goat, they have a lot of weight to them because they have the ability to draw a lot of things to your, to your mind. To your, they have the ability to, to you immediately start thinking of, of, of someone or you immediately start uh, having memories or emotions being stirred up. If you're a Patriots fan and you're like, oh, yes, Tom Brady, all of a sudden these emotions are being stirred up. They carry, these, t- these titles carry a lot of weight uh, because we associate these titles with very, very important things. And so the point of what I'm trying to say is whenever we come to Matthew chapter 25, <clears throat> when Jesus begins his parable, this message with when the Son of Man comes in his glory, that term, the Son of Man, carried a lot of weight to it, especially to his audience. I think, unfortunately for us, that the Son of Man is kind of a, a term that has kind of lost its power because we're like, oh, it's Son of Man, you know, Jesus, Son of God, you know, Messiah, what, you know, Jesus. And that's almost like all we think of. But see, the immediate audience who was listening to Jesus say, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, they knew exactly what he was referring to. You see, this was a Jewish audience, and they were were raised from a very early age immersed in the Hebrew Bible. 
They were raised with the same stories, the same poems, the same things over and over and over again. And so everyone was very, very familiar with the term, the son of man. And uh, it's a term that is used in the, the Hebrew Bible. It's a prophetic term that was used to prophesy for the coming Messiah. You see it uh, most uh, familiarly used, especially to their audience, in Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, we see that there's going to be some sort of coming Messiah uh, who is going to have this incredible authority, some sort of man that somehow possesses divine authority. And so the, the Son of Man, right off the bat, uh, whenever Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, his first Sent this first century uh, Jewish audience would have immediately recognized, oh, he's talking about the coming Messiah. He's talking about this future king who's gonna redeem Israel and restore the rest of the world. They would have immediately been clocked into like whatever Jesus was gonna say when the Son of Man comes in his glory. And so, uh, imagine, uh, I guess you can imagine if I, if I said, you know, one day there's gonna be a president that's just gonna, that's gonna end all presidents. He's going to be the last president we're ever going to need. We're going to have economic prosperity. We're going to have world peace now. You know, we're even going to have perfect health. We're never going to have to worry about dying anymore. Imagine if I said there was a president that was going to come, and it's going to be perfect once this president finally comes. All of us would be like, oh, my gosh, when does this president come? Some of us are probably like, oh, man, he already came. Now he's not our president anymore. <laughs> that was a joke for the Trump fans. We got some. Anyway, that was a political joke. Thank you. All right, anyway. <laughs> Sorry, I had to go there. I just thought it was funny. Um, so in the same way that the titles like the chosen one or the goat, they carry a lot of weight to it, the Jewish, the Jewish audience listening to this message would have been thinking of the many layers of meaning that was related to the Messiah. Because when they hear the Son of Man, they're not just thinking about, oh, Daniel 7. They're thinking about lots and lots of Old Testament prophecies that are layered underneath it. Just in the same way we think about the chosen one, you're like, oh, which one? Are you talking about Nier? Are you talking about Kung Fu Panda? Are you talking about, you know, um, Anakin Skywalker? Are you talking about Harry Potter or any of these other pe people that are called the chosen ones? And we, or we say the goat, you're like, oh, which goat? You know, are you talking about this? But there's so many layers to these titles, and the same way this audience would have been like, there's so many layers to this, this term, son of man that is gonna be the prophesied Messiah. And so <clears throat> what we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at some Old Testament prophecies and we're gonna consider uh, how they're connected to this parable and how this parable would have actually challenged uh, the, the, the immediate audience and their understanding of who the Messiah was and what he was gonna do. And I think that if we truly, if we reflect on these, uh, some of these Old Testament prophecies and actually reflect on this, uh, this parable, it should still very much challenge us today. So the first, um, the first Old Testament prophecy, first prophecy that I think is the, is, comes from, it's one of the most familiar ones, I think, comes from Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah chap, uh, chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, you don't have to turn it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read it. I'm gonna, I don't know a better way than just try to, try to read as much of it as I can. Um, Isaiah chapter 53 says this, it's re when referring to the coming Messiah, it says, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that, should, that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, and yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. After he had suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. And so therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. 
for he bore the sins of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah 53, hundreds of years before Jesus. This prophecy that I don't know how you read this and don't immediately think Jesus. See, this prophecy, I know that some of you might be new to following Jesus. Maybe you, maybe you are like, I don't really read my Bible that often. And there was a lot of big terms in there that I don't understand. To make it simple, that prophecy, all it did was make it clear to us that there was going to be some sort of coming Messiah that will give us peace with God by suffering for our sinfulness. There's going to be someone that we are going to be able to have peace with God again. We are going to be made right with God because he is going to take everything wrong we have done and he's going to put it on, he's going to somehow suffer for it. And so when Jesus, he traveled and he preached a lot of times, people would come to him with their sicknesses and their diseases or their, their circumstances, and they would ask Jesus to heal him. But first, many times Jesus would first say, your sins have been forgiven. And that kind of confuses. I know for me, the first times I, I started reading the Bible, especially in Mark 2, when there's this paralytic man who, who, uh, who's carried by his friends. They, they're wanting to see Jesus because they want Jesus to heal him, but they realize Jesus is inside this home. The home is too crowded. We can't see Jesus, so we're going to go on top of the roof. They dig a hole in the roof. They lower their paralytic man, their friend, through the roof. The paralytic man is laying in front of Jesus. Jesus looks at the paralytic man and said, son, your sins are forgiven. That confused me when I first read it because I was like, I don't understand. He came to be healed. Why did you tell him his sin were forgiven? Why don't you heal him first and then let him know? And the point of that is very profound. Jesus first made a point of saying your sins are forgiving because it was regularly believed back in, in that day, and even I think some people might mistake it this day. People regularly believed if you were sick, if you had a disease, if you were poor, if you were suffering some sort of traumatic circumstance, it was because God was angry at you. You must have done something wrong. And so Jesus, by looking at this paralyzed man, first saying Son, your sins are forgiven. He is letting him know your current circumstance is not because God is angry at you. God does not, he is not mad at you. That would have been profound. My sins are forgiven, but I don't understand. I'm paralyzed. Here, let me show you that your sins have been forgiven. Get up, take up your mat, and walk. That is the authority that we know that God is not angry with us. A lot of the circumstances that we need or that we're facing right now, I think someone might need to know this, that right now, whatever we're going through, you need to understand it is not because God is mad at you. See, Jesus, uh, Jesus um, uh, is, is what a lot of, a few times uh, in, in New Testament, it, it calls Jesus the, the propitiation for our sins. And that is a big, big, theologically dense word, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of help you. Uh, understand what that means if you guys don't know what this means. Romans 3 has this long passage that just reminds us of how messed up we are. <laughs> Romans 3 is the, has this long passage that just reminds everyone you're all infected with sin. You all are messed up. You all make destructive choices. It, it basically, it, the, 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 the culminating verse that kind of takes all of these verses together. It just basically says that we are all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. Basically, I heard uh, someone say this once, or maybe I read it, and it's just always stuck with me. Um, if sin was the color blue, then every action that we do, whether good or bad that we think it is, is always gonna have some shade of blue in it. We are that infected with sinfulness. We are that infected with destructive tendencies. And so Romans 3 uh, has this passage that reminds us, you're messed up. But it then it goes on to say that, but also, we have the opportunity to be justified, made right with God, have peace with God by his grace as a gift to us through the redemption that is Jesus Christ, who God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. See, propitiation is this big theological word that means that Jesus took all of God's wrath and, to, uh, and his wrath and anger towards our evilness and our sinfulness, Jesus took all of God's wrath and sinfulness upon himself on the cross. That the wrath of God was satisfied in Jesus on the cross. To put it even more simply, what it means to say that Jesus was the propitiation of our sins means this, that Jesus took God's wrath for us and he gave us his favor. 
That's crazy to think. What a good God we serve. The fact that someone would see us in our messed up brokenness, not say, you know what, you need to clean yourself up before you come to me. He says, no, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the wrath that you deserve onto myself and you can have my favor. That's incredible. What a good God we serve. If you, uh, there's another passage, if you guys wanna write this down and read it later, in 1 John chapter one, it goes on to talk about, if you claim to be without sin, you're a liar. You're just deceiving yourself. We have a God, though, who is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins if we just confess it. And just a couple verses later, he goes on to say, I'm writing to you this, I'm writing to you this all, so that you might not sin. But if you do sin, we have this advocate who stands between us and the Father, who is the propitiation of our sins. Someone who is always, as we saw in, in uh, uh, Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah, 50, uh, Isaiah 53, Jesus is our advocate who is constantly interceding for us. He's the one who took the wrath of God for us and gives us his favor. God is not angry at you. And so um, this is the first point that I should have made already, but this is the first point that I, that I want to make about this parable. Notice in this parable that the sheep were not invited because they were more successful at not sinning. They were not invited into the kingdom of God because he said, hey, sheep, you did a pretty good job at not sinning. Goats, you're still pretty messed up. So sheep, you can come on in. You guys, tough luck. He did not say that. He did not invite these sheep in because they were, not, because they were su- more successful at not sinning than the goats. And I think um, this is where you also see things where Jesus gives a parable. Uh, he teaches a parable, parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector praying in the temple. He he gives this parable where he says there's a Pharisee and a tax collector. They're praying in the temple. The Pharisee is up front, and he's just thanking God that he is not sinful. Instead, look how good he is. Look how how righteous he is. And then there's a tax collector in the back of the, the, the temple, and he's just beating his breast, refusing to look at God in heaven. And he's saying, God, please have mercy on me, for I'm a sinner. Please. And Jesus telling this entire audience of people, he says it is the tax collector that went home justified that day. Not the one who thought he was so good at not sinning. I think that some, we need to understand that God is not angry with us and also if we think that oh, we haven't sinned that much so why would God be angry at me? You're not invited into the kingdom of God because you don't sin very well or you're, you don't sin a lot. I think one of the biggest confusions that some goats will have on, on, uh, during the judgment is that they thought they would be a part of the kingdom of God because they were really good at not cussing or they were really good at not watching R-rated movies or getting drunk and they never cheated on their spouse. And they're gonna say like, oh wait, I, I didn't do any of these things. Why can't I inherit the kingdom of God? He'll say the same thing to, uh, to, to them, I guess, that he said to um, the rich young ruler who had a lot of money and wealth and he says, what must I do to inherit the kingdom? And he says, all right, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And the rich ruler's pumped. He's like, yeah, I haven't done any of those things. And he's like, all right, you lack one thing. Go sell all your possessions. Come and follow me. And the rich run, young ruler is like, uh, I'm sad. I can't do that. And he walks away. It's incredible to think that it's not because we have someone who's already satisfied the wrath of God who has been, who is the payment for our sinfulness. It is not our our lack of sinfulness that is gonna be our ability to get us into the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus didn't separate the goats from his sheep because they didn't sin. He separated them because they didn't have a true relationship with the Father and the Son of Man, which is manifested through the love for one another. They didn't have a true relationship with the Father and the Son of Man. This is the second point. We have to notice that the sheep were invited because of their relationship to the Father and the Son of Man. The sheep were invited because of their relationship to the Father and the Son of Man. Notice the words that Jesus uses to invite the sheep into the kingdom of God. He says, take your inheritance, the kingdom of God prepared for you since the creation of the world. Take your inheritance. Who usually receives an inheritance? I didn't hear you. Usually it might be a spouse or it might be the children, whoever's following the person, people who are in close relationship with the person who died. 
They are the ones who received the inheritance, the ones who were, had a close relationship with whoever is the one that passed away. They're the ones who received an inheritance. And so, uh, although Romans makes it clear that we're not saved by our works, the Bible also makes it clear that a natural response of our relationship with Jesus is obedience and a love for others. His, a natural response from our relationship with Jesus is an obedience and just genuine love for others. You see, while the sheep were not invited because of their sinlessness, their ability to not sin, they were invited because of the love they had for Jesus that was made evident by their love for others. You see, Jesus asked in Matthew 22, what's the greatest commandment, teacher? He's asked, he's trying to be trapped by Pharisees, I think. Either way, a bunch of religious leaders ask him, what's the greatest commandment? Do you guys know? I always try to make sure that everyone knows what the greatest commandment is. Do you guys know what the greatest commandment is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then, love your neighbor as you. Don't forget about that part. See, these are two Old Testament laws. One's in Deuteronomy, one's in Leviticus. These are two Old Testament laws. And Jesus says, all of the laws that you could ever hear in the Hebrew Bible that you're trying so desperately to follow, they all hang on these things. Just love God and love one another. There's no law in the Bible that's like, well, you know, I think that it would be cool if on a Monday you stood on your head and you did, and then spun around three times. It, like arbitrary laws. All of the laws are based on loving God and loving one another. And so the problem with that, though, is how good good are we left unto ourselves at loving God and loving one another? Are you guys good at that, just by yourself? I'm not. I still have to, like, really, not really, but I still have to work hard at loving God and loving others because my first thought in the day when I wake up in the morning is, Gee, God, I just love you, and I want to serve you today, you know. Or, or, gee, Lord, I'm just so thankful for all these people. How can I show these people that I serve to serve them, and how can I love them? No, usually when I wake up in the morning, my first thoughts are about myself, because I'm extremely selfish. Most of us, when we wake up in the morning, when we're going about our day, we're thinking about ourselves. How can we make life better for us? We're not very good at loving God and loving others, which brings us to more layers of Old Testament prophecies. In Ezekiel uh, chapters, both 11 and 36, but what I'm going to do is read chapter 36. Uh, In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27 says this, that God, he's telling Israel, he's like, I will give you a new heart and I'm going to put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you, and it will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to obey, to keep my laws. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, the Lord is telling uh, the people, after listen, after you rebelled against me and after you come back to me, he says this, the Lord God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and live. God is saying, you're going to need my help if you're going to want to do any of these things. He's telling, and so somehow there's this prophecy that somehow one day God is going to restore the world through his Messiah, and somehow when the Messiah comes and makes everything right, we're going to receive this new spirit, a new heart that will cause us to love God and obey him. But the question is, how does this happen? How do we receive a new heart and a new spirit? And that is completely through having a relationship with Jesus. In the same way that I said earlier in John 3, Jesus says, just as the serpent was lifted up in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that those who look upon him might have everlasting life. And then we get into the beautiful verse, for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but they would have eternal life. We have a new heart and a new spirit through our ongoing relationship with Jesus. You see, Jesus told his disciples that if they truly loved him, that they would follow his commands. But also, something I think we don't fully go on, continue on to read, we just take that scripture and we post it on a post-it note or something. We don't go on to read the very next chapter. Jesus says this, this is the commandment that I give to you, that you love one another. 
So he says, if you love me, you will follow my commands. And here's the command, love one another. See, although we're not invited into the kingdom because of how good we are at not sinning, see, it's a natural process of, of, our, of, of getting rid of sin. The natural process of getting rid of sin is a side effect of our relationship with Jesus. See, the greatest evidence, though, of our relationship with Jesus is revealed in how well we love one another. That is the greatest, greatest evidence of our relationship with Jesus. And as we begin to love one another, well, all, and as we have this new spirit that, that, as Ezekiel said, God's gonna put his spirit in us, as we have the Holy Spirit in us, we'll start to realize the same destructive desires and tendencies that we used to long for aren't necessarily there anymore because we have this new life in Christ. We're this new person. And so <clears throat> Jesus tells us that the greatest evidence of our relationship with him will be manifested in the, how well we love one another. The people who have truly been affected by the Messiah will receive a new heart, they will receive a new spirit that causes them to love God and love others, but we, have, but we receive it by having a relationship with Jesus. To those who have a relationship with the Son of Man, this is, how, this is when he says to the sheep, take, um, he says, take your inheritance. Take your inheritance, which has been prepared for you. I've been preparing this inheritance for you, those who are in close relationship with me. This is also similar to John 10. You notice Jesus calls uh, the people who he invites into the kingdom of God, he calls them sheep. In John 10, he says that I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. The sheep know my voice and they follow me. I know them and they know me. Our inheritance, our entrance, or invitation into to the kingdom of God is completely based on the work of Jesus Christ and our relationship with him. But also, Jesus warns people. In Matthew chapter 7, he says that not everyone who calls him Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only the ones who do the will of the Father. And to the others, he will say, I never knew you. This is, our, this is the last point. You notice, it seems kind of harsh, this language, but you notice that Jesus makes it very clear there is no indifference with Jesus. There's no such thing as indifference. How many, how many, has this, how many of you has this happened to? Um, you, sometimes, usually it's later in the evenings, whenever you might be home, you might be watching TV, and you might be relaxing from a long day, and you're just trying to maybe decompress, and, uh, and the commercials start coming on, and all of a sudden, you start hearing Sarah McLaughlin sing in the arms of the angel, and you start seeing these sad images of animals who, who are abused. <laughs> um, what, do, what do we normally do at those commercials? We awe at them? Well, not me. <laughs> me, I'm like, yeah, get that off the TV. I don't want to see that. Maybe you guys are nicer than I am, but... Usually, for me at least, I'll keep it in the eye, usually for me, I either learn to, to um, uh, grow a hard heart towards those animals and be like, yeah, okay, whatever, they're an animal. Or what I do is I'm like, I can't handle this. Usually, well, yeah, I, I love animals, so I, I'm not very good at sitting there watching all the images and being like, eh, oh well. Usually for me, I'm like, change the channel, I can't watch this. Because usually what they're doing is they're like, please send money so that we can help rescue abused animals and provide medical care for them. And for me, I'm just like, as soon as I hear in the arms of the angel, I'm just like, get, get off. I don't want to see this right now. Um, see, what happens is, at least for me, I don't know about you, I learn to become indifferent. I learn to become indifferent towards the suffering of animals. But the, the truth is, this is not possible when it comes to Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I mean, amen. There's no such thing as indifference when it comes to Jesus. See, when we hear the message of Jesus, it forces us to make a decision. When we hear the message of Jesus, it forces us to make a decision. You either, you're either it says in Matthew uh, chapter 12 that if you're, you're either for him or you're against him. He makes it clear, you're, you're either with me or you're against me. He just made it clear in Matthew 7, you either know him or you don't. You either love him or you don't. 
There's no such thing as indifference with Jesus. The very person of Jesus forces us to make a decision. You either believe who he is and what he said he, he did and what, what we believe in the Bible, or you don't. There's no such thing as indifference. And so while he welcomes the sheep who have a relationship with him, he denies the go to or against him by saying, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Uh, I want to, as, as you consider that passage, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Who is hell prepared for? The devil and his angels. You see that God doesn't desire, he's not preparing hell for us. He doesn't desire that we go there. That's something that we also need to know because of some, one of the main uh, criticisms, I think, uh, of Christianity is, well, how could a loving God send you know, good people to hell or whatever? That's one of their main criticisms. I didn't, I didn't send them there. I didn't choose for them to go. They chose by being against me actively. You're either for him or you're not. There is no such thing as indifference. Hell is not a place that God has, prepared, uh, God has desired to prepare for us, but if you're not with Jesus, then you're against him. And by choosing not to extend love to one another, it's clear that we have no relationship with Jesus and we've sided with the enemy. By choosing, refusing to love other people, it's clear that we have no relationship with Jesus. We've sided with the enemy and hell is the eternal destination that God has prepared for the enemy and anyone who chooses to follow him. So what does a life changed by the Messiah, the Son of Man, Jesus, look like? I, I always go to this passage because I think it is one of the most profound passages in my mind. Chapter, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 through 8, it says this, Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus did, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. That is crazy. Jesus, it says right there that Jesus, who has the same equality with God, did not consider something that he should use that for his own advantage. Rather, what does he do? He considers others as more valuable than himself. He comes as a created, as a human, the God, the creator, comes as a human, and then what does he do? He lives like a servant. He serves the very things that he's created, and then he dies the death on the cross that we all deserve, absorbing God's wrath. Everything that we've ever done wrong, every single destructive mistake that we've made, and the way that we refuse to love God and the way we refuse to love, uh, love others, Jesus says, you know what? I am going to do for them what they can't do for themselves. I, I am going to go live the life that they should have lived, and I'm going to die the death that they deserve to die. And so it says in Philippians 2, have the same mindset as Jesus. Consider others more valuable than yourself. See, those who are truly, truly aware of their sinfulness and those who truly, truly know their need of a Savior and have truly experienced the love and forgiveness of Jesus, they will naturally begin showing the same love that they have received to other people. When you realize, I am messed up beyond my own ability to fix and repair, and you find out that someone has already taken every fault for you, when you find that someone's taken the very wrath of God away from you and directed it on himself, and you realize you've been forgiven, man, that should cause you to want to extend the same love to everyone else. See, this is not a time when you should be looking at other people and thinking, I wish they would hear this message, or I hope that they receive this message. This is not that time. 
I know sometimes in my mind I'm at fault for that. I hear a good message and I'm like, man, I wish this person would just hear this message because this is something they deal with. (laughs) This is not that time. I encourage you right now to eat that thought. Have ears to hear with because this message is for us. This message is for you. And don't try to justify saying, oh, I show love to people. Don't try to make justifications of how you might think you show love to people because Jesus in this parable makes, gives very clear examples of what it means to love others. I would say worship team come up, but go ahead, you're here. <laughs> Jesus gives us very clear examples of what it means to love others. What a life changed and affected by the Messiah who the suffered and uh, so that we might have peace with God, who gives us his spirit so that now we can learn to love God, love one another. He makes it very clear what a life changed by the Messiah looks like. People who can't ignore the needs of others, who consider others more valuable than himself. So I don't know where this parable, where you're at with this parable. There might be someone here who doesn't even know if they believe in God. Maybe you're here and, and you're still, you refuse to believe in God because you think that your life has been so rough and, and you equate the circumstances of your life with an absence of God and you just refuse to believe that God exists. I would say the same thing that Jesus told the paralyzed man. God's not mad at you, he loves you. And your circumstance is not a reflection of your position uh, with God. Maybe you might think that, that uh, you haven't even considered Jesus because you're too far gone. I frequently hear people say, man, I won't even step inside a church because the church would be lit on fire. The, you know, the first time I make a step in church, inside the church building, they think they're too far gone. They think God is too angry at them. Or maybe uh, they haven't gotten to experience the love of Jesus because they think that God is mad at them for their sins. Maybe you think that you know Jesus, but you're being honest with yourself and your relationship with Jesus only consists of the few hours that you spend at church every week. You might not have a relationship with Jesus where you see him throughout every single day of your life. Or you make time to know the one who has saved you from the wrath of God. To, to you, I, I would just want you to know first and foremost, before we even think about this parable, is that God is not far off. God's not angry at you. He has always been near. He has always closely been waiting for you to invite him into your life and even into your present circumstances. God is always close by. I love the term, we were going through uh, the Holy Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit in youth, and one of the, the titles given to the Holy Spirit is, um, we often translate it as the helper, uh, in it, in it, or the comforter, or uh, it's, it's the Greek word, originally the Greek word is paraclete, and it's two words that mean paracle, para, para, and then kaleo, which means, para means someone who is close, someone who walks beside, someone who understands you. And then Kaleo is someone who can be called upon. He is someone who walks with you closely, understanding your present circumstances far better than you understand them yourself, and he is just waiting to be called upon. So before we even consider that parable, if you don't even know the love of Jesus, you think God's angry at you, you think your present circumstance is a reflection of your position with God, I encourage you. I Come see one of the pastors that we could pray with you, that we can invite you into a relationship with Jesus. We can help you walk through that so that you can know this loving Savior who is good, who has given us peace with God through his suffering. That's first and foremost, that's what we need to know before anything. But maybe you're hearing this and you have a relationship with Jesus and now all you wanna do is just show Jesus that you love him. Now all you wanna do is just show Jesus that you love him. Well, imagine if Jesus were right here in this present moment and he was asking you for help. I think all of us uh, who have a relationship with Jesus would be very quick to want to help Jesus if he's just asking in any way to help him. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did it for me. 
Jesus consistently gives us opportunities for us to show him that we love him. I don't know about you, but in my relationship with Kimmy, my wife, usually when I, all I want to do is just let her know that I love her. I probably tell her I love her way too much, or I'm probably, even whenever I'm frustrated uh, in maybe in a situation, all I want to do is make her feel happy and loved and take care of her. And so the same thing, Jesus oftentimes I'm like, God, how can I show you that I love you? I just want to love you. And I don't know about you, but I, because I just want to show Jesus I love him, that's, this is why we have something as simple as a spaghetti dinner. Whatever I can do to show Jesus I love him. Organize a spaghetti dinner. Tell someone that God's not angry with them. I know that we're doing things like the blessing bags so that we can hand them to anyone that we see in need. And I, I'm so excited to hear that a lot of you have just been, been excited to say, I gave out my blessing bag. That's so awesome. And to you, Jesus says, whatever you did to the least of these, you did it for me. And so this is, why we're, this is what raising money for Speed the Light is all about. As we're raising money, this is for us as students, all we want to do is it is our heart to just show Jesus that we love him. It is our heart to not, uh, to not miss out on this opportunity that God has given us. He has already placed before us an opportunity, and I don't want to do to this opportunity what I do to those Sarah McLaughlin commercials, where I just learn to become indifferent to the suffering of others. There are people who are, are slaves right now, who are trapped in rooms, who have no option but to be forced into unwanted intimate relationships with people who just view them as objects. And I don't want to ever know that that is ever going on in our world. That bothers me to no end. I can't imagine if that was my wife. I can't imagine, I don't have kids, but I can't imagine what if that was one of our kids. If that was one of our students, I'd be flipping out. I'd be doing whatever I could to go in there and rescue any of our students. And so this is the opportunity we have there's people in India right now that Project Rescue is trying to rescue. They need vehicles to do so. So I don't want to miss out. I don't want to become indifferent to this situation. And I'm definitely not trying to guilt anyone to, to helping out in any way. This, this might not be the area that, that God is necessarily leading you to help. If you are right now in a place where maybe finances aren't, you don't have the resources to help in that way, I would say take a blessing bag or just go to someone on the street and let them know that God loves them. He's not angry at them. Their present circumstances do not reflect the love that God has for them. So I encourage you, you guys, if you guys want to come to the spaghetti dinner downstairs after service, you feel free. You're invited to come. We're just raising money to do this. But first and foremost, what I want more importantly everyone to know is that Jesus loves them. I want them to know God is not angry at them because Jesus was the suffering servant, the son of man who took up all the wrath that God had into himself and he gives you his favor. And to those who know that, who have a relationship with Jesus, he tells us let's love one another. Let's not be, ang be quick to be angry with one another, not be divisive. Instead, let's love one another. Show me you love me by loving one another. So I don't know where this parable has you, but I know that it is a parable that we can't just sit back and do nothing. I encourage you as we go, reflect on this parable. Jesus, what do you want us to do as, as individuals, but also as a body of Christ? If you guys would stand, I want to pray for us. And then Joe's going to conclude us in a, uh, in a song. As I said, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus that wants to begin a relationship with Jesus, please, uh, I'll be here. Pastor Ron is, is here. We have other pastors uh, that are here. Please find someone because we want to be with you, to partner with you, and not just sing some sort of prayer that'll, that, that'll get you into heaven or something like that. No, we're here to partner with you to pr begin an ongoing, committed relationship with Jesus.